Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome someone who had a big impact on my thinking, and that is Mr. Mark Ford. He wrote a uh, fantastic book. Well, he's written a few books for sure, but the one that really influenced me so much is Ready, Fire, Aim, a fantastic philosophy. Mark, welcome. How are you? Thank you, Jason. Great, great. Thank you very much. It's good to have you. Good to have you. And I, I know you, you're you not a guy who does a lot of interviews, so we feel especially privileged to have you here today. What do you have, about uh, five or six books now? Actually, there are uh, more than 20 books uh, oh. published at this point, but some of them are on subjects that I have books on uh, poetry and short stories, and uh, but most of them are business, wealth building, self-improvement area, but more than 20, actually. Fantastic. I want to talk about some of your books and your prolific career there as a writer and also as a newsletter publisher. And really, I mean, I guess you're the guy that kind of launched a a new industry, uh, you know, in your involvement with Agora and so forth. So I kind of want to let you talk about what you've done because it's... uh, Well, I I like for you to continue spreading that rumor, but uh, the industry, the newsletter, the financial (laughs) newsletter industry was really... If you got to give credit to one guy, it would be a guy named Bob Kephart, who... Okay. He's no longer with us, but he he was the publisher of KCI, Kephart Communications, Inc., and he started back in the late 70s. Uh-huh. And I got into the newsletter business in the um, about that time, too, but I was on the business-to-business side. I was writing newsletters for mm-hmm. a newsletter called uh, African Index, Latin American Index, and so on, uh-huh. academic. And uh, the newsletter business is older than that. Kiplinger Newsletters have been around for, I don't know, 60 or 80 years, but the actual investment newsletter business, which created the market from which actually all these other businesses have sprung, even the information marketing business and a lot of the internet self-help businesses all originally came from indirectly from that business. And uh, I got involved after I got back from Africa. I was there uh, teaching. Uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and I got uh-huh. back and I worked in a small newsletter publishing company. And then One thing led to another, and uh, then I got involved with Agora after my first retirement, when Agora was still a growing company. And uh, can you give us a sense of what year this was? Like you talked about, was it Bob uh, Gephardt? Did you say is his name? Bob Gephardt. Yeah, he in the seventies that Mm -hmm. he started, uh, mid seventies, I think. We started publishing newsletters down in Florida. I had become a partner of a, a newsletter publishing company in Florida that was publishing business to business newsletters. And we got into the investment publishing business in, I would say, 1982 or 83. Uh-huh. By 1987, when we had that first stock market correction, by that time we had about 30 financial publications. Uh-huh. There were probably a dozen major players in the industry back then. Uh-huh. That shook out a, a number of publishers. And then really, the next big change was around 2000 when the industry went online and realized that the future was on the Internet. And that really shook out a lot of other of the competition. When I joined Agora, which was in about 1990, I think, or in the early 90s. Okay, and so Agora was founded in about 1979, I guess, right? Yeah, it was. It was, yeah, somewhere around there. Bill and I were competitors. Bill Bonner. Bill, Bill Bonner. Yeah, he's been on the show. Yeah, right. and I saw Bill, a product that I had created called the Oxford Club. Uh-huh. That still exists today. It's still a very successful product in publication. Yep. And um, and we saw a lot of our financial, because my partner was right in predicting that there was going to be a crash in 87, but he was wrong in thinking that it was going to devastate our market. So we sold basically all our financial products before the crash. We felt very good about that, and they all went on to make gobs of money afterwards, and uh, we ended up going into the merchandise business. 
let's see, that was uh, 87. And then I retired for a few years after that. And then I went back to work with Bill in the early 90s. And his business was a growing business. But in 2000, we grew the business to about, it was about, I don't know, it was like when I got there, it was just gotten their promotion out. And its first year, they were at 24 million. And then by 2000, we were up to 100 million. But we just couldn't, we were actually up to 100 million a few years before then, but we couldn't really figure out how to get it any larger than that. And then mm-hmm. the, the internet age came and uh, decided to, uh, Bill and I each started our own internet publication. He started something called The Daily Reckoning. The Daily Reckoning, yeah. Read it for many years. Okay. Yes, it's great. Well, Bill's columns, I love to read. Yeah, he, he's just such a great writer, but so are you, of course. <laughs> Both of you. Bill is more philosophical and... Mm-hmm. Uh, and I tend to be more practical. That was always the basis of our business relationship, too, I think. Then what happened was I was doing early rise, he was doing that, and we decided that we shouldn't push for any more business growth. So we we had already put the business into like eight divisions, each of which were, were autonomous, more or less, with their own publishers. And so Bill went to France, and I went down to started spending most of my time in Florida, where I lived, and started working here on our, our own versions of the Internet. We found our way, and we developed models that Agora still uses today. But what happened was the business just took off from there. It went from 100 to, I mean, these days, Agora's revenues are over half a billion dollars because of the big, big advantages of the early Internet. You know? mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Didn't even understand them at that point, you know. Right. And you've been writing books all along and so forth. What's your latest book? I think my latest book is, I just published a book, well, a book of my poetry, which is called It's Raining, Lovely Raining, uh, was published, uh, just came out about two months ago. But I think last month they published, or this week or something, it's like a year after I write them that they ended up getting published, so I can never remember. But the latest is something that's called How to Speak Intelligently About Almost Anything. Mm -hmm. And it's... uh, it's a bluffer's guide to seeing, being smart in cultural situations. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. How to bluff your way through a museum or a dance recital. Is that written under your name or a, a pseudonym? Yes, yeah. While I was writing uh, Early to Rise, I used the pseudonym uh, Michael Masterson. Mm-hmm. And then when I stopped writing for that publication, we kind of sold it to some friends and I still have an interest in it, but I had pretty much written everything, all my ideas about entrepreneurship and building businesses. I had written about plenty of times, so I stopped writing. And then then when I was uh, persuaded to get back into the business of writing about wealth, per se, and investing, I decided I would just use my, my regular name. And so I've been using Mark Ford since then. Why did you use a pseudonym in the first place, Michael Masterson? What, what was the reason for that? Too many fans bothering you? <laughs> you know, that's actually a bit of an issue. But I agree. It was really, what happened was I had been mentoring some copywriters and they were doing very well. They're making a good income. And these guys were friends. One of them is my oldest friend who recently passed away. And I said, you know, it's great to have an income, but you really need to have equity too in your life. And uh, you start with income, but once you get income, you've got to go after equity because equity is a thing that will last forever if right. you do it right. And so I explained to them what that meant. And I talked to them about they should start their business. And so they decided they would start a business teaching other people how to be copywriters using the terminology and the techniques and stuff that I used on them. And they wanted to use all my lessons and the memos that I'd written them and all that stuff and wanted me somehow to be involved. And I said I would, but I was already, at that point, I was retiring for, I think, like the third time. Mm -hmm. So I said, you can do all that, but don't bring my name into it because I don't want to be involved. I don't want to be a celebrity. I don't want to, you know, I just don't want any of that stuff. I want to just go retire and... And so, you know, we had used in the investment and uh, health publishing businesses and so on, we'd use pseudonyms all the time. So one of the copyright, one of the guys that was doing this, came up with the name Michael Masterson. I said, fine. You know, it was, uh, I didn't think I'd ever run into the name again. I, you know, they were going to have their business, Michael Masterson. It was stuff I gave them. I thought that was the end of it. But as it turned out, as they started developing it, they kept talking to me about it. And I got more and more interested in the business. You know, and so I was kind of drawn back into it. So no, suddenly they're having a conference, and everybody knows me as Michael Masterson. So <laughs> I, would, yeah. I would always explain that. Just that go with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's but, okay. You know, that's a, that's a common rumors. practice. So, yeah. yeah. What's, oh, what are yeah, the rumors, though? You know, Mark Twain wasn't 
really Mark Twain. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Samuel Clemens, and uh, there's a whole host of people. There. There's a whole host of them, yeah. And, and many celebrities change their names, you know, whether it be fashion designer Ralph right. Lauren or John Denver, or, you know, singer, right. whatever. Go. Yeah, good stuff. Talk to us a little bit about Ready, Fire, Aim. I mean, would it be fair, by the way, Mark, to say that that's one of your most popular books? I would say that and uh, Automatic Wealth were probably the two biggest bestsellers. Mm -hmm. It is a book that I particularly like of the many books I've written because I would say that that incorporates my personal view on how to build small businesses. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, the, the truth about doing anything is always uh, common sense, simple, and in some ways obvious once you understand it. But I would say that that book represents my own particular way of looking at it. The concepts in there were things that I discovered personally and that I felt were true and in some cases felt contrary to what was being taught in the popular business press and so on. Typical, I mean, the whole the title, Ready, Fire, Aim, is, illustrates one of my main bugaboos, which is people that write these advice to people starting businesses and tell them about mm -hmm. all the things they have to do to prepare themselves, all the legal things, all right. the, you know, printing up business cards and all these crazy things that don't. And happen. writing big business plans and all that. Right, yeah, right. right. Yeah. have nothing to do with actually starting a business. And in fact, they become great tools for procrastinating and mm -hmm. for making yourself feel like you're in business when you're not in business. Yeah, training salespeople over the years. I always say that uh, you don't want to be the person who's getting ready to get ready. Right. <laughs> you know, right. and, and we've all seen that type of person, whether it's real estate investor who's got to know everything before they make their first deal, burgeoning entrepreneur who's got to know everything. And so many of these people, they're kind of know-it-all types, you know, where they've read every book, they've been to every seminar, they read all the newsletters, they know all the players, but they're never going to be one of them because no, they're, they're really they're, spectators they're, at the end of the day. I right? know, I like them. I like those people. They always make me smile because, you know, you almost feel like they, the comment I love best when they read, you know, a book like Verity Fire Aim, which I basically think is the best book written on this subject. I've never read a better book. Uh, of course, it's my book, so You're it partial. appeals to me somehow. <laughs> you know, I love when people go, ah, tell me something I don't know, you know. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. I'm like, well, if you know it already, then what are you still reading business books for? I mean, probably one out of 100 books I read is a business book. I'm not interested in business books, but I've started 100 businesses because I know the important things about business you learn from experience, and that's what I tried to put in that book. And so... That book represents, to me, the best experience-based advice you can get on starting a small business. And somebody says, I already know it. And I'm like, okay, well, what are you doing? Are you like sitting around waiting forever to hear some advice you haven't heard? If you hear some advice, if you've read like 10 very successful people talking about business and they all tell you the same thing, what is the logic of that position? I'm not going to do the things that 10 experienced successful people told me to do. I'm going to wait until I hear something that I haven't heard before, and I'm going to try that. Right. <laughs> you know, that doesn't sound like a good idea. Yep. I just think it's funny. Yeah, I completely agree. Share an example with us, if you would. One that I remember from the book, although it may not be the example you want to share. You talked in the book about the movie business, the film business, and how the traditional road was, you know, go to film school and do all this stuff. And the other one is just make a film. <laughs> right. And, you know, learn as you go. And maybe it's not that example that you want to share with our listeners, but that's oh, one God. I remember. No, I mean, I, I mean, I probably should because it's an example of... Uh, I've made three or four movies, and they've all been utter failures. In fact, my first movie, I only had it reviewed by my nephews, who were 12 years old at the time. And uh, I got three reviews. One of them said, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd give it a zero. Oh, my the other one, you know, The <laughs> other one said, uh, you're never going to be able to criticize another movie. And then the third one said, well, no, you can criticize. You just have to say that my movie was worse. Oh, I know. Then there was a fourth comment. He said, you know, it was kind of like a pornography, but without the good stuff. <laughs> That's what I did in the movie business. But for me, I, I spend my money and I learned, you know, I learned a lot about how to make a bad movie. But the movie business, like everything else, is all about selling the business. And the reason that I never expected to make money on any of these movies, I always knew I would lose money. In fact, I actually raised money for one of the movies I did. And I told my friends that invested with me, I said, listen, I'm not going to promise you that you're going to make money. In fact, I'm going to promise you you're going to lose 100% of your money on this. 
And uh, they actually made money. On, well, they didn't make back all their money, but they made back so far about 8% on their money. So that's the high point in my movie career. But it's, it illustrates the point. I went into that business just so enthused about the product and my ideas for the movie and about the process. But I spent no time at all thinking about selling the movie. I just had this vague idea that I would make the movie and I would bring it to uh, Sundance and they would immediately accept it and then we would show it and win all the audience awards and then somebody would come to me and hand me a big contract. But that's not actually what happens in movies. What happens typically is for 95, 99% of movies is they get made and nobody picks them up or you, you get somebody to pay you a very modest amount of money, practically nothing, and then you get tiny little royalties. Yeah, that's a similar truth about the book publishing industry, say, too. Absolutely. It's funny, Michael, though, the way you talk about that. Uh, Michael, I'm calling you by your pen name. Right. Sorry, <laughs> Mark. I just about <laughs> yeah. Um, Mr. Masterson. <laughs> and right. uh, it's funny the way you talk about it. You seem to be really bragging about these failures. <laughs> Am I sensing that correctly? Well, I guess, what are you going to do? You know, you've got to enjoy them. I knew going into it, I would, I would not make money. I just went ahead and did it anyway. I mean, it was fun. I enjoyed doing it, and uh, I don't regret it. I didn't measure the quality of experience by whether I'd make money. It's kind of like uh, there's a lot of things. you can When you go on vacation, you spend money, and you don't expect to make a return. Right, a right. Return. It, it was fulfilling as a creative endeavor, right? Since theoretically it could have been a business, and I could have approached it that way. I wouldn't say I'm proud of myself, but I, I'm not embarrassed, and I think it's funny that I violated all of my principles in that book and uh, ended up losing a lot of money because of it. But had I not violated them, I just wouldn't have gone forward because I had no, I mean, my whole idea in Ready, Fire, Aim is figure out how you're going to market it before you market it, before you spend a lot of money. So I would still be waiting to shoot those films because I would not yet have figured out how to sell a movie because I don't, I still don't know how to sell a movie. Yeah. I actually have a business that does reviews of uh, cult movies like monster movies and stuff like that and I thought that I might learn something because that's a very big part of the music industry and I've had that for years and that thing hasn't made any money so mm -hmm. I haven't got a clue I mean this is something I say in book and all my writing is that your strongest possibility as an entrepreneur is sticking with something that you know you need to know the industry well enough to figure out how money is made how products are sold and in for stage one business and that's a beginning business i say that every stage in a business has a primary challenge a problem to get over and a, a primary opportunity and then a, a primary strategy in stage one the primary problem is that you have a limited amount of time capital and patience and that's going to run out and before that runs out you have to figure out what I call the optimal selling proposition. You have to figure out how to bring in new customers at an allowable acquisition cost. And if you haven't figured that out by the time you run out of that money and those the patients and, and the other resources that you have, then you're one of those 50 to 90% of businesses, depending on how you want to look at it, that fail. That's the core idea, and that's the biggest problem. It's the most common problem with entrepreneurs, and they just think they're going to figure it out They'll do what other people are doing. They'll figure out later on. But it usually doesn't work out that way. It's much smarter to devote almost all of your time and resources to figuring that out first and trying not to spend too much money doing that. Mm -hmm. So I just want to be clear on the example. Just in a nutshell, the example is the traditional route, the non-ready, fire, aim route would have been what? Go to film school, spend a bunch of money on school, have a bunch of student loan debt, you know. <laughs> Not even yeah. that. Okay. I mean, what I did was the traditional model, which was, in let's say, the last two films I made. I hooked up with somebody that had a bigger reputation as I could buy. This last movie, we got a DP, a director of photography, that uh, major guy from Hollywood that had done a season of The Entourage and all these other films and, you know, paid him good money to come in and got a script that was approved by people in Hollywood that they thought it was exciting and then th this person was interested and that person was interested. And if I had wanted to, I could have made this thing sound like it was going to be the, the next, um, you know, big thing. So I all that stuff, got great actors, did everything right, got the good 
and we produced a movie that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are the names of your movies? Is one of them the Agora movie about, can't remember the no, name. No, no, I didn't do that. That oh, was done by Addison okay. Wigan okay. about uh, yeah. Yeah, I.O. USA. No. Yeah, I.O. USA. Yeah, Addison's been on the show a couple times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what are the names of your movies? Well, the movie that is being edited right now is called After Midnight Everything. Mm -hmm. And that's a coming-of-age movie about mm -hmm. these teenagers growing up in a bad neighborhood that opened up a bar, uh -huh. a rock and roll club, okay. in the 1970s. And the movie before then was a movie I did with Herschel Gordon Lewis, who's a cult film director called The Uh-Oh Show. And this is crazy to talk about these movies, but the point is that in The Uh-Oh Show and in The Uh-Oh Show, I got distributors too. But what did the distributors do? They just made me big promises. And uh, we ended up making back 6 or 8% on, on the money that we invested. And so when I made it, then that's the one I had friends in, involved in. So uh, when I made them my next film, I wouldn't let people invest in it because I knew I was going to lose all the money because I hadn't figured out how do you sell a small budget movie mm -hmm. the big you key know, is distri know. distribution is the hard part that's what everybody will yeah, tell you that's what it is and it's basically just like the book business you know you yeah. can have a book but how do you get it distributed right, right but at least now distribution is easier than ever I mean now at least you know it's democratized it's flattened if you will on the you can internet yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah but if you go the conventional route right now you know when I go to John John well he published my books and my book sold 50 thousand copies on average, which it puts me in the top like one percent of their publishers, of their authors, one or two percent, believe it or not. But even at that level, they won't spend any money advertising me. Yeah. It's only the, the, sure. the mega stars that make those businesses work. So yeah. what about everybody else? They write a book and they go, they shop it around and nothing, you know. But that's the selling side is shopping around conventionally. Right. I'm all about uh, selling books on the internet yourself because you write the book, you know, that's your that's your invested time. And then you, you start learning how to sell your book where most of your the cost is, is your time, not spending a ton of money on advertising. And yeah, you, yeah, right. you can figure out what works. And there are all kinds of quirky ways that you can sell books. I mean, you know, Agora basically is an information selling business and it sells over five hundred million dollars worth of information every year and that other people I work with who similarly sell tens of millions of dollars worth of information. So we know that and I agree with you. It's like it's a democratized scene right now where it's not cheap, it's hard, it's competitive, but there are cheap ways of testing ideas and uh, getting out there and substituting labor for, you know, people can get, you know, some, if I had a book to sell, we could be trying to sell this book through your your show and right. uh, yeah, absolutely. Ways. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how to phrase this, Mark, but but the way that, like you said, all these other people that aren't doing things do. But you know, what would be just wisdom that you can share with our audience beyond what we've talked about already? I, I mean, I absolutely think the ready fire aim methodology is is a great one, and it had a huge influence on me. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Let me put it this way. What are the most common questions you get from the audience? Why don't we spend five minutes well, and see if I can that, That's a great question. Yeah. yeah, good good stuff. Thank you for asking. So a lot of our audience is into the real estate investing angle. Right. You know, I believe real estate or income property, I should say, not real estate per se, but income property, income producing real estate is the most historically proven asset class in the world. Of course, businesses are great, but, you know, they take some talent and some proper thinking, as we've talked about, and, and stuff like right. that. But, you know, as an equity play, you know, yes. just for the common right. man, the income property is great. I see so many people suffering from paralysis of analysis, and I tell them, get your book, <laughs> you know, the ready, fire, right. aim. You know, life is on-the-job training. Life is an iterative process. There's another book that's sort of a, I sort of say it's almost a parallel with Ready, Fire, Aim, and that's uh, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries, uh, more on the technical side, yours is more right. on the philosophical side. It's just about go put something out there, what he calls a minimum viable product, and then listen to the feedback and iterate and change it. And with right. real estate investing, I think it's the same thing. You cannot know everything before you just do it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? No, you know, I agree with you. I, I've written about real estate a lot, and one of the things I say, and I say, you know, right now I, I've been writing a series of essays for uh, a business called Palm Beach Research Group in Delaware Beach, and they have a newsletter called the Palm Beach Letter. We've been publishing a newsletter called Creating Wealth, which is my ideas about how you create and develop wealth. And 
I'd written dozens of essays on real estate. In fact, I have a whole little real estate program that I give people called Rental Real Estate 101. And for me... And I know your brother does that, of course. I've had him Oh, that's right, show. Justin, yeah. yeah. He, he, he did a, an advanced course for us. But, you know, for real estate has been the single biggest, best-producing asset class for me. I've been in the business of publishing about stocks and bonds and other financial instruments for 30 years, but I've made most of my money from real estate mm -hmm. after business. You know, most of my income came from business, and but in terms of equity, which we were talking about, equity buildup, and also income too, real estate has been number two. And I kind of agree with you. The good thing about real estate is I want to advise everybody to become an entrepreneur. I wish everybody could. But the truth is, you know, you talk to some people and you just go, this person is just not going to make it, you know. Yeah. Even if they're enthusiastic, they're just not clever. You know, the, to be successful in business, you, you don't need to have a high IQ, but you have to have street smarts. You have to be clever. You have to be willing to say, well, geez, this isn't working out. Let me try this other thing. And there are some people that just don't have that capacity. And so real estate really is much simpler. That's why I like to recommend it, because it, if you stick with local real estate, you're going to know most of what you need to know, and uh, you're going to figure out the other stuff soon. And if you approach it, using the kind of safeguards that I'm sure you've talked to your readers about. I know Justin has models that he uses, and we have models. There are ways of making sure that you, you don't get involved in paying too much for properties. And uh, you know, it's, and, and it's just buy them and that. hold them, you know? I mean, it's just such a pretty simple thing. I mean, back to the ready, fire, aim concept. There's just no way to know all about it before you do it. And even as you're doing it, you're going to learn more as you go, you know, even if you own right. 100 uh, single family homes, you're going to keep learning throughout your, your investment career. So right. I think that's such a good philosophy and methodology. Where can people reach you and uh, find out more about your work? Well, as I said, um, currently I'm publishing, you know, if, if anybody wants to read my poetry, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to pay them to buy my poetry books. <laughs> you're so funny but, uh, to pay them to read it. <laughs> Right. But um, but there's a group in Delray Beach. It's part of Agora. It's called Palm Beach Research Group. And we publish investment advice, typically. But all the stuff that we publish comes through the filter of my personal wealth building experience. And uh, so there's a lot of advice that we don't, you know, kinds of investing we don't. I'm a very, very conservative investor when it comes to stocks and other financial instruments. And so everything we publish is very, very safe. And so um, that's where I am, Palm Beach Research Group, and I'm in there as Mark Ford. People can get access. We have a lot of we have a free daily service that's called uh, Palm Beach Daily. People can get it and, and you know just test it out and see if they like what we're trying to do. What I'm trying to do in that little business is build a business that I can be proud of, which means giving people advice. I'd be happy to give my friends and family member. In fact, I do tell them just follow that advice, and I put my nephews and nieces and aunts in feeling comfortable because it's very safe. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you one more thing about this business I'm very proud of. If you call up this business, our customer service department, that customer service person will say to you, hi, my name is Maggie, and my job, I want you to know that my job is to keep you completely satisfied. Whatever you call about, I'm going to completely make you satisfied with the result I'm going to give you. Plus, I want you to know that I'm entirely empowered to do that. And I promise you, you have nobody has ever heard a customer service person say that because most businesses won't tell their customer service people, you can do whatever you need to do to make that person happy. Mm -hmm. You can refund them 100% and you can give them more products for free if you want. Whatever you want. I probably shouldn't be saying that. Somebody's been calling up. Yeah, to someone's going to take advantage of that. Right. <laughs> but, but we don't worry about that because we think in the long run, our business is going to be much better if we distinguish ourselves from everybody else out in the market, that's um, taking a more um, protective approach to their business. So anyway, I'm very proud of that business. Certainly companies like Apple and Nordstrom have built great brands on that concept, uh, sure. among yeah. other things that their brand is known right. for. But but I, I agree. Right. In fact, just one other thought uh, real quickly, maybe you want to comment on this. I posted on Facebook recently after calling Apple and having such a good experience calling them, they answer the phone quickly, they take care of you, they process refunds quickly, and it's a wonderful company to deal with. Same with Nordstrom, right. same with uh, many other companies that I haven't mentioned. But I said, why can't airlines, cable companies, and cell phone companies be like 
Apple and Nordstrom. Oh, God. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a nightmare. You're so right. Yeah. Here, here's we what it is. We should start a national movement on this. It's amazingly how badly we are treated yep. by cable companies, yep. airlines. Those are my two top yep. choices, too. And we just allow them to do it. And somehow, I mean, just... It's horrible. It's just horrible. Airlines, number one, you could argue at times in history, while the airlines are having trouble, you know, they have to treat you like crap because they can't afford to treat you better. But that's not true anymore. You know, they're getting all monopolistic and they're doing fine. You know what it came down to, Mark? The reason is, is that the companies that treat you so poorly are heavily union run. The unions run Mm. them. And, you know, there's no union at Nordstrom or Apple that I know of, at least. Right. But there's certainly unions in the airlines and the cable and the phone companies, right? You know, well, I, mean, I, I hadn't thought of that. And uh, but I don't think that's the entire answer, but I can certainly see how it is an answer. There, yeah. I mean, certainly in the airlines, you know, when you've got some uh, battle axe up there that telling you to sit down or she's going to, you know, she's going to have you arrested or right something. right of course, that, of course that she's probably the reason she's probably there in first class is because she has seniority not because she was yeah. she was considered by her superiors to have the best manners but even but, uh, beyond that mark it's when you call them and you have to wait on hold for 40 minutes yeah i know and then you have to change your flight and it's impossible and they lie to you and make the excuse right. that it was weather apple and nordstrom would never do that type of thing <laughs> you know i mean listen just, why don't we scare Schedule, I'll be glad to call back and we'll yeah. let's put a whole 90 minutes to you and me <laughs> bitching about these. Let's do it. <laughs> these companies that are giving us trouble. Okay, absolutely. I'm on board. Well, good. One last time, where can people find you? Of course, on Amazon, your books have great reviews. Did you give out a website or anything? It's Palm Beach Research Group. If they look up Palm Beach Research Just Group, that. Okay. the Palm Beach letter, they'll find it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Mark Ford, Michael Masterson, we appreciate having you on the show, and it's been great talking to you. And pleasure. Pleasure. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.